uh, most of us here speak Hindi and English. So in case if you have a question or a comment in Hindi, please feel free to type that in and we'd be more than happy to translate it for our speakers and the audience. Uh, there are two boxes that you see uh, in the center of your screen. There is a Q&A box uh, where you can add uh, your comments and so on. And uh, on the other side uh, on the right side you can also see uh, a comment section uh, where you can uh, add any comments or thoughts that you have so please use both of them separately uh, we're also tweeting so you can use the uh, hashtag cornet conference or at the rate cornet underscore india uh, to tweet at us and uh, finally just a quick note that uh, we are already deeply grateful that not just all of you but also our panelists could make the time to be here uh, we're all going through a lot uh, in our personal lives and in our professional lives. It takes a bunch to already just show up and be here. So please be mindful of that and respect uh, of everyone's sort of time and effort and, and, and please speak with each other with patience. So yeah, with that, I'd like to pass it on uh, to uh, Nishant, uh, who would be moderating uh, the session for us this evening. Uh, just a little bit about Nishant before I uh, give it, pass the mic to him. Nishant is a researcher working on problems related to financial inclusion and social security uh, from a systems design perspective. Uh, he's the head of research analytics and, a head and, and the head of uh, the Social Protection Initiative, which is SPI, Advara Research. And he works on designing a vision for uh, the future of social security in India. Uh, owing to the distinct socioeconomic realities of the country. So with that, I'll uh, quickly pass it on to Nishant to carry on the session. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rohan. I hope everybody can hear me, Rohan. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. And I just wanted to start, before I start, just wanted to thank Rohan and his team, Manupam Priya, for organizing this event. I'm sure the other plaintiffs also um, gone well. Um, and I also wanted to echo the same thoughts. Um, I wanted to pass on my condolences to anybody and everybody who's affected by the pandemic, um, who are panelists, audience, whoever. Um, it is difficult having kind of a discussion around what happened last year, and especially things are really bad this year as well, very close to home and in, in a much larger scale. Um, but then again, I think this these discussions are important and kind of having these discussions now will have a kind of very big impact um, over the next year or maybe two years in the medium term for us. So it is quite important uh, for, us to, for us to be discussing these issues. Um, and in that mild footnote of positivity, I just wanted to kind of introduce you guys to the panel today. This will be a plenary discussion on the economic vulnerabilities and the importance of social safety nets. Uh, learnings from COVID. Um, um, we've got an excellent, kind, excellent or accomplished panel here with us, bringing together research from different fields. Um, I'll bet all of them have a very unique intersection, which we'll talk to today's kind of topic. Um, and again, uh, just just a little bit on that is that I know a lot of panelists today, people in the audience, myself, have all been part of conversations around the same time last year about what do we do about how do we study the effects of the pandemic and the pandemic induced kind of lockdown, which had a significant economic shock. And it feels it feels about the right time to sit back, to kind of understand and discuss the kind of issues that we've studied over the last year. Um, understand thoroughly and also kind of look forward to what we can do about it. Um, so before I introduce the panelists, just to give you a quick kind of agenda of what are the broad issues we'll be discussing today, or there will be a lot of issues um, discussed either through the panelist discussions or through question and answers. But broadly, we wanted to discuss um, the impact of the economic shock um, that was caused by COVID. We also wanted to kind of place that in the discussions around design and delivery of welfare and social relief. Um, introduced by the government, both central and state, during the pandemic, the effectiveness of these responses as well. Um, we wanted to collectively kind of understand things about what went right and what went wrong, um, because there were many, um, and kind of use that knowledge to look forward into you know, what can we do in the short and medium term to kind of improve the social protection architecture we have in India. And, and 
definitely i believe kind of with these kind of discussions would help us move towards some sort of you know uh, more resilient uh, frameworks that we can discuss so without further ado i think this is a really interesting panel panel that we have we have uh, i'm going to introduce panelists in the in the order that we would kind of be talking to them so there is no specific order being um, um, as I, except for that, I think the first one I want to introduce is uh, Shweta from Dalberg, Dalberg Advisors. Shweta Totopal is a partner at Dalberg Advisors. She leads the gender uh, gender practice and the social protection programs. She is currently kind of leading the large demand and supply uh, side study across five states to improve uh, ways to um, ways to improve PDS and MNREGA. She also was a big part of. So, and led the Dalberg State of Aadhaar Initiative, which had two reports out and very good reports. So anybody who's not gone through them to read them very thoroughly. Um, so hi, Shweta. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Amit Basile from Asim Prinji University. He's a professor of economics in the School of Arts and Sciences at Social Protection. Um, uh, Asim Prinji University. He also heads the Center for Sustainable Employment. He too leads a very interesting report called the State of Working India, which I'm a big fan of. It's going to release on the 5th of May, if I'm not wrong, Professor. Uh, very interesting, looking yes, forward yes, to that yes. and hopefully discussing some of those. If you could give us a sneak peek into some of those, uh, we're here for the preview. Um, Madhumita, and we also have Madhumita Heber, who's a independent consultant. She's a social policy specialist, uh, supporting governments and development partners in design, implementation, and evaluation of social protection. Um, programs, social services, and poverty reduction programs. I think in the recent years, she's been working more on digital social protection and kind of shock responsive uh, systems that across South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa and in the Caribbean. She has um, kind of key publications in the top, in these topics, um, which, I'm, which I'm sure we could share in the chat for those who haven't gone through to read. Um, really happy to have you with us. Hi, uh, long time. Uh, and we have Shayana from the World Bank. Uh, Shayana is the senior economist in the World Bank's social protection and jobs practice, South Asia. In her present role, she leads the bank's development policy dialogue and, and, and projects with the Ministry of Finance, Government of India, and other state governments on social protection measures following COVID. Um, she's also leading all the discussions with uh, state and central governments on DBT transfers and social protection delivery programs. Um, and they're, and again, they're something that we would love to get a sneak peek of and a preview of is that they, the World Bank and her team are currently working on really interesting work that tracks, um, you know, the social, the impact of programs um, through the pandemic with the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy and their large scale survey, which is nationally accepted. Okay, so hi, everybody. Sorry for putting you on the spot and making you awkward with all those long introductions. I know. Um, but really happy to be here with all of you. So I just want to get started. There's almost about 10 minutes in, and we should have a good long discussion forward, hopefully with some interesting ideas. But I want to start with, we would love to hear from Shweta first to get generally an idea about, you know, um, kind of what kind of programs have been the ones that have been introduced as a response to the COVID, uh, to COVID first wave specifically. I know there's a lot of work also you're doing on studying, you know, continuous impacts. Um, but would be great to hear from you about what were the, what was the kind of government's response and how effective it was to COVID 19s first wave. And with that, I'll give it over to you. Sure. Thanks so much, Nishant, and thanks great. so much for, to the Cornet team for um, for having me. I hope that everyone on the line is staying safe and sending all of you and your families and loved ones um, my best. Um, as Ms. Shant said, I'm just going to spend 10, 15 minutes sharing a bit of context about um, you know, what we learned about social protection programs over the last year, um, especially in, in, with the introduction of PMGKY. It, when, the, when the crisis hit you know, last March, especially with the announcement of the lockdown, we saw a few things happen. Um, one was an immediate loss of income and, and livelihoods. And so even amongst the, the, the poorest of households in India, we saw household income drop significantly. We saw quite a lot of people accumulate debt, um, even in the first few months of the crisis. We see the figures here, you know, running from 
families getting you know, earning on average 6,000 rupees to, to dropping to 3,500 rupees in those early days of the lockdown. Um, and you know, quite a lot of families accumulating debt in those first few months of the, of the crisis last year. And at the same time, so we saw, essentially we saw you know, families who are low income become poorer. And at the same time, we also saw quite a lot of people first become, um, fall below the poverty line, nearly 10% like of, of families. And at the same time, you know, as the, as the pandemic continued and even as lockdowns were um, uh, removed, what we saw was that, you know, even as employment rates recovered, we didn't necessarily see income rates track. Um, and so we, you know, even as of late last year, we saw that quite a lot of people continue to report a loss in income. And that question, you know, that raises the questions of, you know, how stable is the recovery and what's the quality of the recovery that we were starting to see. And of course, now with the current state of where we are with, you know, renewed lockdowns with the current health crisis, um, it's, we don't know exactly where we are today and kind of what that fin the financial picture and the economic picture of families looks across, um, across the country. And I think Dr. Ahmed may speak a little bit to that when he, um, when he speaks. But all of these statistics and kind of that situate that early situation and ongoing situation, I think point to the heightened need for social strong for social protection schemes uh, in the country. And with that, you know, what we saw was as the crisis hit, there were a lot of researchers, and Rohan, if you don't mind flipping to the next slide, we saw lots of lots of researchers come and step into the stage and to understand really what was happening um, from a from a financial perspective and economic perspective to a social pers uh, perspective, and in particular, look at the role of social protection programs. You know, as far as we know, there were already over 25 different schemes, um, different studies that were done just on social protection programs alone over the last year, um, done by lots of different organizations, VARA, JPAL, Azim G, CMIE, ID Insight, um, ourselves included. And I think we've learned a lot in terms of you know, what's been working with that social protection programs, what's not, how did they uh, perform in light of the, the crisis situation. And from our perspective, there's kind of six themes that I'd wanted to share, you know, coming from the various different research efforts. Um, I'll share a few highlights here, and I think that you know, the panelists will probably be touching on many of them over the course of the discussion today. Rohan, if you could flip to the next slide. Um, the first is really a question of coverage. And what we see, and we'll talk about this, is that in general, PDS has done much better than cash transfer schemes. And so secondly, we see uh, social protection programs do much better in rural areas than urban areas. Number two, we saw that there's been a really steep ramp up in service delivery, but there's important gaps that continue to, to persist um, around the delivery. And not, not all people actually got the schemes that they were entitled to last year. One of the drivers of this is number three, which is a real focus on inclusion errors by the government um, and kind of preventing people who are not uh, meant to be entitled beneficiaries rather than focusing on kind of a more of a universal approach. That combined with kind of complicated backend systems um, have made grievance with us all a challenge. And then one of the other things that we learned, you know, over the course of the crisis, but through the delivery is that, you know, where people found the, entitlements and the social protection delivery really helpful where they got it, um, but actually it didn't cover all that much of people's expenses. And there is a question also, especially as, you know, as the crisis continued over the course of the year, PDS, the cash transfers expired. And as we head into the second wave, you know, what should be done now and do we need a second wave of, of relief? And the last two points are really a question of um, vulnerable and marginalized groups. And so while you know, there's aspects of the schemes that did really well from a, um, from a performance perspective last year, those often reflect the averages. And what we see, especially in the case of migrant workers, but also people um, who are just not listed at all, they really struggle to benefit from social protection schemes and the performance of the schemes is much lower. Um, and similarly for women, um, we've seen challenges in terms of their awareness, how much coverage and, and delivery that they're actually getting. And there's a broader question also of, you know, how tailored are the programs actually for women's needs. So I'll dig into each of these for a few minutes. Um, the first is around, you know, coverage of, um, of PDS and, and cash transfer schemes. And what you see is that, you know, PDS coverage on the whole is really high. Um, and that's true both in rural and urban areas and section up the side here, but you see that um, kind of on the whole, 
range the estimates range anywhere from 60% to 85% plus um, in, in terms of coverage amongst low income populations. And the delta between rural and urban areas is, was not all that high last year. But then when you look at the individual cash transfer schemes, Jamdan, Narega, Ujwala, Pionkesan, social pensions, you see coverage figures fall pretty drastically. You know, lower ranges anywhere from 9% in the case of um, pensions, and the highest at Jamdan around 55 to 56% of households who um, were registered for this scheme. And then when you actually take a look from an urban perspective, you really see the, the drop off, right? And in many cases, the uh, schemes are really designed to be rural programs. I think last year really highlighted the need that, you know, highlighted the point that in a crisis situation, actually urban um, households also are severely affected. And it pointed, uh, pointed us to this question of actually, do we need to be strengthening our social protection schemes from an, um, from an urban perspective? Some of the challenges, I think, you know, in terms of preventing coverage, one of the big things that comes up and it'll kind of keep coming up in our conversation is a real focus on preventing inclusion errors. And what that makes, how that translates for the individual is it makes it really hard to register and register with the support of local authorities in the Panchayat. Um, there's often an extensive need for documentation and it can become te tedious to register. Um, it can be really difficult also to separate from you know, household ration cards to your own ration card, especially in the case of single women. Um, and we also see that a lot of the issues around coverage stem from the fact that we're using really outdated SECC data to look at eligibility. And so there's a broader question also of, you know, how do we think about eligibility and who should be eligible in the first place? And what we see separately from coverage is that, you know, even where people were covered and registered for the schemes, we saw that performance actually really ranged in a few different ways in terms of service delivery last year. Um, one, there was a, quite a lot of variation in terms of how each different schemes performed. Two, there was a lot of variation in terms of um, state level variation. And three, there was also a fair bit of variation in terms of um, how individual schemes performed over time. And so what we saw is that, you know, in the first couple of weeks of the lockdown, it actually took the government infrastructure just a bit of time to just like catch up. It was both the government infrastructure, but also people's awareness of whether they were eligible and what they were eligible for. And we saw it get much better actually by May, um, about a month into, into the lockdown, the second kind of wave of um, second uh, disbursement of, of, the, of the relief efforts. PDS in particular did pretty well. Um, the vast majority of people who registered were able to receive their rice and wheat. But the other piece that um, isn't, didn't quite work in terms of the distribution was pulses. Um, and the PMGKY initiative announced a you know, pulse top up as well. And we saw quite a bit of variation in terms of how states were able to deliver. And even as um, disbursements progressed over time, we saw that on average only about 46% of people said they actually got their, got their pulses. Um, when you look at the other cash schemes, you see that, you know, at best you got to about 70% of people saying that they actually received the, their cash schemes, um, their cash schemes over the course of, over the course of the, the, for those first few months of the lockdown. And there, look, there were a few states that did really well, right? States like Belangana um, and did well across both PDS and, uh, and cash transfers. Kerala and Karnataka also did really well from cash transfers from a PDS perspective. Kayana did really well from a cash transfer perspective. Rohan, would you mind flipping to the next slide, please? Part of the issue though, is that, you know, when you look at the numbers that we showed, you know, we're saying that for cash transfers in particular, you're getting to about 70-ish percent of people saying they actually got the transfer, which means about 30 people percent of people saying they, they didn't get, get the transfers. And what we're seeing is that, you know, it's been a really big focus on inclusion errors and faulty backend processing that actually make it really challenging for people to, um, to, to address the, their, their grievances. And so one thing that we see, for example, with Jamdan, the issues really are due to faulty backend processing, issues around Adar linkages, updating Adars, having the you know, link to Adar and, and, and um, having spelling errors, blocked accounts, and so what we saw see um, through research, for example, that Vara did is that quite a lot of people actually said that they, um, they weren't able to ultimately get their DBT and it was become primarily because of backend uh, processing issues. 
It's a little bit different for the case of PDS. In the case of PDS, um, you're able to see kind of local issues kind of solved for themselves because of the individual relationships with, uh, with local community members. But actually the issue has become more around pending applications for ration cards um, that were needed to avail of FP and GKY. And actually what we're seeing is also in some ways it's becoming harder to um, register for PDS now. With Norega, what we're seeing is that there's issues really stemming from exclusions in work and exclusions around payment processing issues. And this continued um, over, the, over the course of the last year. And actually with Norega, it's, it was kind of one of the best schemes that actually has a bit of a grievance redressal system. And even there, only about 8% of people who registered complaints were actually had actually had their issues resolved. And so I think this points to some of the issues around the back end, right? Which is, you know, there's front end issues around who gets registered, how to get registered, and how inclusive is the system in the first place. But even if you're in the system, um, quite a lot of people get dropped off, especially on the DBT side. And a lot of that is, be is um, happening because of a lot of the reliance on technology. And I, the way that I see it is that technology in many ways has enabled DBT to work and work fairly smoothly. But for those who it's not, we haven't quite figured out how to stem the exclusion that's also resulting from using technology. On the whole, what we see is when we take a step back and just say, you know, how did the government perform? What we see is the government support has been beneficial where it's been delivered. We saw quite a lot of people, over 80% of households say, and that number increased over time, is that the government support was helpful where they got it. But when you look at the actual percentages and how much of you know, essential supplies, et cetera, covered, you know, the average payout over the course of April to May was on average a little over a thousand rupees. Some states it was a little bit higher because there were additional state top ups. But on the whole, you know, it really wasn't covering a, a vast majority of essential um, expenses at a time where actually incomes were falling quite significantly. Um, so I think there's there's one question around you know how much is the coverage, and then there's a second question of. You know, do we need to actually be looking at a second round of social protection in this time as well? I want to touch briefly on issues around specific population population groups. Um, and so while we saw the numbers around the averages earlier, what we saw is that you know just over fifty percent of migrants last year actually reported receiving government assistance. And this is some through some work done by done by JPAL. Um, and there's lots of drivers, right? Issues around awareness, exclusion from official records, exclusion from DBT processing due to inactive bank accounts, et, et cetera. Um, I think there's a lot of hope that you know, One Nation, One Ration Card can really help the situation. There's a few states that have started to implement it. We'll get data on that soon, actually, from some of the work that um, folks, including us, are, are doing. But there is some question also of how do you really make sure that ONORC implementation works to ensure that you know, people who are moving um, are actually able to avail of their rations. And when we look at the story from a, a gender perspective, what we see and what we see through some of the work that we've done is that you know, the social protection schemes have been really critical and important for women, but there have been some important issues across each of the different schemes that we, that we looked at. Um, so for example, with Jundan, you know, when we look at women, actually only 43% of women acknowledge receipt of, uh, of, of their, the, the transfer. And when you, you know, took a further look at a more segment level, single women were actually less likely to receive it in comparison to married women. Um, when you look at Norega, there's some good news, right? Which is that actually, um, once you're registered, women and men were both equally likely to get work when they applied. But actually there's an issue around registration. Um, we saw that women were 10% less likely than men to be registered on the Norega card in the first place. So there's real opportunities, I think, to improve each of the schemes to be more women-centric. And more broadly, there's a question of how do we not look at women as a monolithic group, but as different segments with different needs. Um, and I think there's actually an opportunity for us to do a lot more work from a social protection program perspective in terms of the design and implementation uh, of social security schemes. So with that, I wanted to leave with a few questions um, that this, you know, that what we've learned had left for me. And I think that Nishant and the panelists will talk about at some level over the course of the discussion. Um, one is a question of, you know, as you look at everything in the aggregate, have these social protection measures been offered? Were they sufficient? Um, to what extent actually do we need to be focusing on announcing a second measure during this wave right now? Two, how do we minimize exclusion gaps at the coverage level for various schemes? 
you know, what's the role of having a universal social protection registry? Number three, um, how should we be thinking about social protection schemes in urban areas? Do we feel now that we'll, from what we've learned through the pandemic that there is an imperative for urban social protection programs and what should or could that look like? Number four, how do we balance the very real and important tension between minimizing inclusion um, and kind of addressing um, exclusion gaps? And number five, how do we better improve and design an implementation for vulnerable and marginalized groups? Um, so those are some of the things that have been kind of on my mind as we think about the future of social protection programs, both in the immediate term as we were dealing with the second wave, but also more broadly in the medium to longer term. Um, I hope this intro to kind of what we've learned over the last year was really helpful. And I encourage you all to read the, the multitude of research that has come out of, over the last year. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back to Nishant to lead us through a discussion on these topics and many others. Thanks so much, Rina. This, this, this is actually really useful. I think your last slide raises some really important questions. And I hope we could come back to some of these um, you know, uh, towards the end, and I think there's some really important questions that we need to take on, not just from a COVID point of view, but I think from a long-term future of social protection point of view, I think some of these are really important. I also do believe some of the points you raised, specifically on kind of the access of, uh, for example, uh, schemes, cash transfers versus PDS, which is again well-documented, well talked about in the last year, but still now we have solid numbers to back that some of those things up. The access issues for across gender groups and occupational groups um, and across different schemes, which seems to have some level of uh, some level of differences across them, even though most of them are cash transfer based. I think it's important for us to kind of dive into all of those points. So maybe, maybe the, the first thing that we can start with because um, we have Dr. Basley with us would be around the occupational groups to understand kind of what has happened um, in terms of um, impact, not predominantly to migrants, because we've been talking about this for over a year and again now, um, but also across the whole spectrum of informal labor. I think there are two questions that I would kind of bring him in and also, you know, for him to kind of enlighten us with some, with some more things about the labor market. One would be the kind of extent of impact on of both unemployment and income losses from an occup from a labor market perspective um, and secondly on also about given the fact that people lost their incomes they turned towards safety nets um, both long-term safety nets and the immediate ones announced by the government so how useful were they in both extending you know help towards um, each of these uh, Kind of informal uh, groups, especially those of migrants. So I think I'd, that would be great for you to come in and tell us about possibly those um, of how the pandemic impacted the labor market. Sure. Thanks, uh, thanks, Nishant, and thanks, Rohan, and the Cornet team for having me. Uh, Nishant, uh, incidentally, uh, you were the last person I met in a professional capacity in the flesh. Uh, on the day that our college closed down on March 15th. <laughs> I think uh, I was trying to remember if I've actually met anyone after that, and I, I don't think I have actually. I remember I running family, back I home like that. when so, the students were also like real. <laughs> yes. We were packing up that day. Yes, it's, it's been a very, uh, very difficult time, as you said at the beginning. But yeah, let me, um, uh, I'm very sorry that I was not able to send my slides in time to integrate into the deck. So I'm gonna have to do a little bit of juggling with screen share, pardon me for that. Uh, but I will show you some uh, data from the State of Working India report that you alluded to that we are almost ready to bring out. So we are launching it or releasing it next week on Wednesday afternoon, 5th May. Uh, and our Twitter page and so forth have the details for registration for people who are interested. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll just share my screen and give you some brief sense of the data that we have in there. Uh, I'm not going to go into the much into the social protection coverage, et cetera, which we also talk about, but Shweta has already done an excellent, uh, much more comprehensive job uh, of, of that. So, so I won't go into that. Um, let me just uh, start by sharing my screen and 
actually just showing you first what we do in the report to give you an idea of the context for what I will talk about. I hope you can see the table of contents here. Uh, uh, so we are, we, are, we are setting the stage in terms of the Indian economy uh, uh, and its performance prior to the pandemic. Uh, it's important to remember here that uh, the economy was in a significant slowdown before the pandemic hit. Uh, it was the longest uh, slowdown in terms of consecutive quarters of slowing down of growth uh, in recent memory for more than 20 years, actually. Uh, so, you know, we, we, the economy was structurally quite weak, even going in, and that's very important to keep in mind. And then we talk about employment loss and recovery. We talk about informalization and earnings losses. We talk about how households have coped with falling incomes. Uh, we talk about we talk about the social protection architecture and its effectiveness, and then some recommendations. So, obviously, I'm not going to talk about all this uh, today, but let me show you a few um, you know examples, as I said earlier. Uh, so uh, let me start by showing you uh, actually what Shweta had alluded to briefly, which was the recovery, the incomplete recovery in employment and incomes, and what we see in the CMI data as far as that is concerned. Uh, so this is um, just a picture, uh, you know, which shows you the WPR, the workforce participation rate, and the average uh, per capita household income, both on one graph. Uh, over January to December. We don't have income data from CMI beyond October at this point. Uh, they've just released November, but we haven't had the chance to put it in. And uh, the CMI data on employment after December will be released uh, at the beginning of May. So that's also not in here. So this is really largely a story of late 2020. And the point that this figure is making is that of course you have the huge dip due to the lockdown, then you have the bounce back, but the bounce back does not go back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, we estimate that the workforce remained about 15 million below the pre-pandemic level, uh, and incomes remained far more significantly below uh, the pre-pandemic uh, level, as Shweta alluded to. So uh, there's more of a bounce back in employment, as one might expect, but there's a strong income effect here. And that's coming, the, the persistence of this low lowered incomes is coming from a big informalization effect. So what's happening is that people are finding work they found work when they came back, but not in comparable uh, employment that they had before. Uh, and for that, um, let me go, uh, let me now actually just share, maybe I'll just share my whole screen and see if then, it, then I can sort of show you everything uh, without having to toggle. Uh, Nishant, let me know if you are able to see this as I move between pictures. Um, uh, uh, can you see this donut graph? Yeah. Okay. So, so yes. what we have done, yes. you know, from the so we CMI, can, we can. yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, so, what the, one of the things that we've done on the CMI uh, data is it's a panel data set, as some of you may know. So, we are following people across multiple points in time and seeing what happens to them over the course of a year. So, we've we've chosen December, April, and December for this analysis. So, December 19, April 2020, and December 2020, it it allows us to uh, say. Uh, you know, what proportion of workers have, were not affected. That's the yellow or the mustard over here. What proportion were affected, but then they were able to come back to the labor market, to come back to employment. What proportion did not recover, which is the blue. And you'll see here that there's a huge gender effect, which also I think briefly was alluded to earlier, that women were impacted far more, both in terms of, you know, uh, losing jobs in the first place, but also not being able to come back if they lost it, right? So, uh, both uh, the no effect is much lower for women compared to men. You can see that in the mustard. Uh, and then the no recovery is much higher for women compared to men. I should predicate, uh, you know, so I should caveat this by saying that CMIE, uh, the data is not so good at capturing women's employment. And that I can say more about that separately if people are interested. Uh, so, you know, it's possible that women are in employment, but in ways that are not being captured. Uh, so in other words, they're going into types of informal employment that the data does not, that the survey does not capture. Uh, that's possible. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there is an effect here that is a gendered effect and that's a strong, uh, strong one. Right? So, um, uh, so the first big point that I want to make is that uh, you can talk about job loss and recovery, but you have to remember that there is a lot of heterogeneity. I'm showing you gender. Uh, there's also a lot of heterogeneity by age. Younger workers are much more affected. Uh, there's a lot of 
um, flux going on. So, you know, there's an overall recovery of the workforce participation rate, which is up to 90, 95% of its pre-pandemic level. But there's sort of, there are workers who never come back. And then there are workers who are out of the workforce who take their place. And that happens a lot for women in particular. Uh, women who leave didn't come back, but other women took their place. And so on the aggregate, the WPR sort of recovered. And we're still trying to piece together this sort of flux story. We don't know exactly why it's happening, uh, but, but we do know that it's there. Right? Uh, now, the other big point, uh, other going beyond the job loss and recovery story is this informalization story. So here, uh, th this is a bit of a busy graph, but let me just walk you through it in a couple of minutes. Uh, you'll see employment categories on both sides of the, of the, of the flows. Okay? So the categories are uh, daily wage, DW, self-employment, SE, temporary salaried, which is informal salaried work, TS, and permanent salaried, which is uh, formal. Okay? So um, uh, uh, maybe I should zoom in a little bit. I'm not sure if people can see this very clearly. Uh, uh, so, what we're trying to see is where were you before the pandemic in 2019 and where did you end up after, uh, during the pandemic, uh, after the lockdown, right? So we are comparing September to December 9, 2019 to September to December 2020. Um, and I want to draw your attention to a few things. If you look at the male, uh, the men on the top first, uh, you'll see that there are big flows that happen between self-employment and daily wage work. So daily wage workers going to self-employment, self-employed workers going to daily wage work. These are sort of flows within the informal sector, if you will, as people move to find occupations. But then there is a uh, significant flow in the permanent salaried workers who are moving to self-employment. And you'll see that here at the bottom. Right? Nearly half of them uh, are going either into uh, self-employment or into temporary salaried work uh, or even into daily wage work. So we find that about on average 50% of those who were formal pre-pandemic ended up being informal post-pandemic, giving you a sense of the magnitude of the shock because these are relatively secure occupations. Now for women, the story is actually very different. They're the biggest category that emerges as the uh, sort of fallback is actually not an employment category. It's just simply dropping out of the workforce. And that's OW over here at the top right. right? So you see big flows from daily wage work, from self-employment, from even permanent salaried work to out of the workforce. So while men are able to go into self-employment or some other kinds of fallback activities, women are basically just leaving or they are being forced out. Okay. Uh, as you can imagine, all of this has big impl implications for incomes of households and earnings of workers. So I'm not showing you data on earnings per se. Let me just skip straight to the household income bit. So we looked at CMIE labor earnings. We've also looked at CMIE household income data. Uh, and I'll show you a picture from the household income data now. Uh, so this is showing you, um, this is actually something called an event study analysis. I won't go into the details of it, uh, but uh, suffice to say here that the anchor is February, 2020, which is set to uh, zero or one. And then we are looking at incomes relative to that for different deciles. Okay, so let me again zoom in because this might be too small people. Uh, let me just go to urban. Uh, I can come back to rural if people want, but the point is made well enough by urban as well. So we are seeing deciles, 10% categories of households from poor to rich. D1 is the poorest 10%, D10 is the richest 10%. And you see a very clear ordering of what happened to their incomes. Right? So they bottomed out in April and May for the poorest 10 and 20%. Uh, and even the uh, the the third and the fourth deciles were pretty hard hit. Uh, you know, uh, we are looking at steep drops in income, but then they bounce back, right? Uh, and uh, they, they don't go back to the pre-pandemic level, as I already mentioned. So the, there's a persistent income gap goes into October, as far as we can see. Uh, but cumulatively, because the drop is so sharp, cumulatively, this is a huge deal. So we've calculated that for the bottom 10%, this is basically losing about 15,700 rupees of income over those eight months, uh, March to October, uh, uh, you know, which, is, which is a big deal coming on a low base, as you can imagine, the welfare impacts are pretty large. So what happens as a result of this is that the, the poverty uh, you know, really increases sharply. So let me show you that, um, uh, uh, just in terms of what happened to poverty. Sorry, I have to scroll back. Uh, so we are not looking at um, the, uh, 
uh, Tendulkar poverty line because we think it's too low to be meaningful. We are looking at the national minimum wage, which is 375 rupees a day. Obviously, a lot of people are below that level even pre-pandemic. Right? Uh, but what really happens is that during the pandemic, the number of individuals, the estimated number of individuals who are falling below this 375 rupees a day line uh, really hugely goes up. So this is rural, which is about uh, you know, 130, 140 million. And you add that to, to urban, um, uh, which is actually, sorry, next to it, 90 million. That's a total of 230 million people who are uh, falling below uh, this line. Uh, the red is the counterfactual. So what would have happened if the pandemic did not happen? Obviously, there would have been a drop because incomes were growing. So uh, you know, instead of reducing poverty, we see a very large dramatic increase in the number of people below this minimum wage uh, line. So I'll stop sharing here. Uh, and let me just uh, summarize my points by saying that uh, we have these enormous effects on informalization and income. Uh, we have the safety net. Shweta has already done a great job of summarizing what was the coverage and where is the shortcomings. So I look forward to the discussion now on really what should be done going forward, because as you can imagine, the second wave is going to hit on top of a very low base and, and a huge impact. Uh, I didn't talk about indebtedness and food security and so forth, which we talk about in the report, but I leave that uh, for some other time. Thank you, Nishan. Sorry for going, going over. Some of, some of that is really nice to see. And just maybe a couple of points that I will maybe pick up and for us to discuss towards the end was just the fact that you said the, the, the informalization of labor, the kind of shift to jobs that are less uh, you know certain incomes that are less certain and um, and falling out of the labor force altogether when it comes to uh, when it comes to women i think these are kind of long term impacts right so the I, I i suppose the general conversation we would love to have towards the end was more about now how do we how do we deal with that situation because it's not something you can just you know snap your fingers and get back to like we saw the graph at the labor force participation level. So it's not something that you have an immediate fix to, and it's that's kind of why I uh, the the point that even you and Shweta had made at the beginning about it being a very very unstable kind of comeback is is actually really detrimental for us in the long term because for us to get back to the level of formal employment, which to which historical social welfare programs in India have been tied to formal employment and employer guarantees. Um, have to come back. So I will come to that. I know you guys have a very interesting proposal. So maybe towards the end, I can come back and ask you more about that. But that's just two points I wanted to pick out from Professor Basley's kind of presentation. And we should be really worried about that. Um, that unstable kind of equilibrium position that we are right now. Um, so, OK, so quickly to move and change gears a little bit. So we have sort of seen the impact. We've also seen kind of the programs and their efficacy um, and an overview of that from uh, kind of Shweta's work as well as all the work from the Cornet group. Um, I want to bring in Madhumita uh, to talk a little bit more about the, so the kind of the uh, viability of the solutions here. So we've talked about and general government movements all across the world have been moving towards kind of cash transfer systems, not just to mitigate you know, short term stress, but also to think about long term welfare programs and their efficacy. Um, through cash transfers. I know you guys have, you specifically have done a lot of work on just kind of thinking about is the state, uh, and I mean all forms, all tiers of government, are they ready to kind of, uh, kind of go digital, to go kind of DBT? Um, I know you guys, you've particularly measured DBT readiness, et cetera, uh, in the past. Um, I want to bring you in and ask you a little bit about how do you think the system is working and where where are cash transfers working well where aren't they working and what can we think a little how can we think a little bit more about making them better um, especially during these kind of times when when there is a real uh, problem with respect to like income shocks um, so hey, do Madhubita, can you hear me yes so, uh, yes uh, okay great thanks that'll be uh, great yeah uh, uh, thanks to the Cornet team for inviting me to uh, speak uh, today. And I think uh, everyone has done a great job of setting the 
context. I think there's really no question about the uh, precarity of uh, livelihoods in India, right? Um, what I want to do in answering the questions that uh, Nishant has laid out for me is uh, reflect a bit from some of the other countries I've been working closely on over the last year, particularly in Asia, to see what lessons we can draw on in how social protection systems and programs can respond, particularly during such large scale uh, shots. Uh, and looking at the slides that uh, uh, Shweta presented, uh, as well as all of the other research that's coming through, uh, what's striking is that uh, with a few exceptions, the bulk of the measures under uh, PMGKY have targeted existing beneficiaries, right? That's people who are already within the ambit of the social protection system, getting some routine uh, programs prior to COVID. Uh, and the system didn't really scale up in a big way to cover the new poor or the new vulnerable for the lack of a better word. Um, and the refrain we've often heard is, how do you prioritize them? We don't have data about them. Uh, how do you enroll them in pandemic segments, et cetera, right? And uh, I want to sort of draw on what other countries have done to sort of show the opportunities and possibilities that uh, lie uh, in India. Uh, the first point I want to emphasize is that understanding uh, uh, is to understand that delivering social protection requires a whole set of activities, right? And exclusion can happen in any number of stages. Uh, of course, the other based DBD reform has helped streamline some of these, such as payments and maybe reducing leakage to an extent. Uh, but challenges do remain in other parts of the delivery chain, right? Where other based DBD by design will not be able to make a dent. Uh, this appears like a very basic point, but I think uh, one that needs to be continuously reinforced because conversations do uh, tend to be overwhelmingly focused on other based DBD. Uh, so despite the DBD reforms, there was very little India could piggyback on to reach uh, new beneficiaries, hence all this discussion on uh, where is the right data uh, uh, to use to prioritize who should be supported. Um, sure, there were a lot of upper middle income countries who use these, what you call social registries or social protection registries uh, to provide support to new households and individuals, but there were also others uh, who devised more creative solutions, right? And I wanna give examples from three countries I've uh, closely looked at. And, and the first is the study on Bangladesh, perhaps I can circulate a, a link later in the notes, um, is a country that does have a social protection registry with a very good coverage, but it has not been used to date because of other reasons that I'm not going to go into. It was collected nearly five years ago. So when COVID hit, it was obviously outdated and it could not be used. Nevertheless, the government of Bangladesh rolled out a new emergency cash transfer that covered about 5 million households in the country who were registered, assessed, and paid after COVID hit, largely comprising of informal uh, sector workers. And they did uh, use uh, the high levels of mobile penetration in the country and high level of penetration of mobile banking in the country uh, to be able to uh, do this. Right. Uh, of course, the pace of the response was not perfect. I think although the uh, program was announced in May until August, they had only paid about two thirds of the beneficiaries. Uh, but nevertheless, it's an example of a low income country being able to uh, sort of launch an emergency cash transfer from the start in the absence of data. Uh, the other country I've looked at is uh, Pakistan, which also has a similar registry. Uh, but the registry when COVID hit was 10 years old. Uh, so there were limits to the use of this data in identifying new beneficiaries. Nevertheless, Pakistan used other methods to reach 7.9 million beneficiaries who were not about the registry through other methods, right? Uh, mainly by using the uh, uh, online applications as well as district level uh, capacity to enroll um, new beneficiaries. Uh, the last one I'm looking at is uh, Indonesia, which also has a, a social protection registry, but with only about 40% coverage in the country. 
but when COVID hit, the data was again outdated, five years old. The data quality was non-uniform across the 7,000 plus districts, a very highly decentralized uh, uh, country similar to ours, which led to a lot of chaos and confusion uh, in the early days in terms of what data should be used at all. Uh, nevertheless, across a range of programs, they have used their local governments mainly to register, verify, and enroll and pay over 24 million people who were not a part of the social protection system before COVID-19 hit, right? So there, were, there are creative solutions that are possible. Yes, data can be helpful, but the data coverage, quality, uh, accuracy, et cetera, matter a lot. And uh, these are kind of hard conditions to meet in low income countries anyway. Um, and even when there's no data, countries have used a combination of local level capacity and digital tools to identify new beneficiaries, right? I think as the second wave is already underway, it's time for India to also consider some of these uh, strategies in providing income support to people who are not within the current uh, social protection uh, system. Um, that brings me to the last point on this balance between inclusion and exclusion errors that uh, Shweta alluded to in her presentation is, I think in a crisis, the focus needs to be on uh, including more people, avoiding exclusion errors rather than leakages um, and sort of inclusion errors. Uh, and the way to mitigate them in all of these countries has been good grievance redressal and accountability systems, right? None of these countries had a perfect response. The complaints were several, but they were not only programmatic level grievance redressal systems, but more broader sector-wide uh, uh, GRM systems, as well as civil society organizations who played a very strong role in the delivery of social welfare and that to a limited extent helped keep uh, inclusion errors at bay while avoiding exclusion errors to the extent uh, possible, right? Um, and overall, a couple of points then is, first is these countries had a very strong political commitment to social protection, right? Uh, you do need to you do need the powers that be to believe that it's the duty of the state as a part of the social contract uh, to provide this protection at this time, uh, and that's very strong in all of these countries. And the second issue, which is common across all of these countries, is investing in decentralized capacity as a part of social protection delivery, right? I mean, social protection is not just uh, uh, throwing cash at people, right? It needs a set of activities and it needs a set of capacities to be able to do it well, which a lot of these countries have invested in. Unlike India, where over the last uh, decade or so, there's a strong focus on centralization via technology reforms rather than building local level capacity, almost in a sense, replacing local level capacity with centralized technology uh, decision making which uh, certainly doesn't serve well in a crisis time uh, when a lot of the action has to be local. And uh, the last point, of course, is around building accountability structures to deal with uh, leakage and fraud to the extent uh, possible, not just through program specific uh, systems, but also broader uh, uh, civil society uh, participation. So I'll just stop there because I think I'm running out of time and I'll hand this uh, back to Nishant now. Thanks, thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. I think that's a couple of things there, I, I, especially when you're, when you're talking about Bangladesh, maybe there's some very similar architectures that are present here. Maybe there is differences um, in the way uh, political setup works. Maybe that's it, but I, 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 I I, I would do, I, I probably I'll come back to you on this, just to get a more kind of sharper understanding of what is it um, that we need to focus on right now. Because for example, all of our work has been saying, you know, this is the backend mechanism systems have to improve. And the typical response has been, yes, they will. It is over time, this is a very young system, it takes them to build, et cetera, um, and kind of fix errors. But, and for, and for us, it's been more around, 
there is no grievance address so how do you kind of feed back all of the problems that you kind of are understanding from the um, from the failures in the system itself how does that feedback into the system? so so maybe because we are running out of time probably we'll come back to you but i would like to just move to um, uh, to shana just to um, hi shana just wanted to get your quick reflections on just a couple of things that we've discussed it discussed um, which is more on a, just generally what do you think has been um, the because you've had almost a year of actually studying all these responses and been part of discussions in kind of even helping design them what do you feel about the the broader response to covid by both state and central governments and kind of where do you think um our biggest learnings are from to kind of build the next set of protection systems that could maybe not in a pandemic setting but kind of going forward to mitigate the risks that um, amit and shweta had pointed out yeah. very specific thanks thanks nishant and actually rohan i would request you to just hold off on the slides because i just want to make a couple of remarks and then you could continue to the deck um firstly thank you so much nishant and thank you to the coordinate team um this i've actually learned a lot just listening to everyone and it was great to sneak peek into uh, amit's report which we all benefit from uh, tremendously so that was that was actually very useful i made copious notes and i have questions for him later i want to actually start nishant by ask, answering a question that i think you had posed which is what should we do immediately and i actually think that there is um in the way the government has set up financing for social protection there's a very important window that has been opened through the pandemic which i don't think i don't think we've talked about right now which are the state disaster response funds now these are for those who are unaware under the national disaster management protocols there are state government funds that are allocated from the center specifically to manage disasters now when covid was classified as a disaster as per those protocols what also happened was a certain amount of money was triggered at the state level, government level within the state disaster response funds and it is completely up to state governments as to how they transfer that money to whom they transfer that money in which locality and what instrument they use right so it's um, for example kerala used a lot of that those funds for relief materials also cooking and also cash in some cases up as well has used some part of those those funds that are available and as we see in the current situation there are going to be localized lockdowns it doesn't seem like at least right now it doesn't seem we are in a world of a national lockdown yet uh what i would anticipate and i think one of the things that can almost immediately be done and i hear governments such as the state government of maharashtra uh thinking about using and accessing some state government funds along with these state disaster response funds because the resources available with states to start to trigger either income support or even an employment program support i mean the instruments are up to state governments based on local needs and what they think is locally flexible and and possible and feasible right within a certain area be it a district or a city and the reason i think the state level intervention is very important is twofold one is almost every thing that amit in particular and i think even madhumita laid out greater informalization the flux in the labor market deep heterogeneity right even in the labor market and as madhumita said the need local state are the fund for rupees right that ashwatha mentioned that are being transferred that are essentially being transferred to a, a rural village in bihar vis-a-vis -a, -vis a city context is bombay and as we know that that 1000 rupees means very different things and in the current pandemic impacts are very different and highly localized and so you need a quick adaptive system and my sense would be a uh, given that the 15 finance commission has increased the budgetary allocation significantly of state disaster response funds they are available with state governments in fact the government has allocated 40% of these disaster response funds specifically for relief and recovery which includes cash support livelihood support as well 
that state governments may start to think of using these resources because while different states are trying, be it an urban employment program or other kinds of experiments, state resources are extremely limited. They're fiscally constrained in the current environment. They will need financial support from the center. So I would, I would sense instead of a pan-national set of interventions, you may start to see the use of this social protection window from the disaster response funds as the second wave continues and localized forms of support within say containment zones or particular cities um, and particular areas as state governments decide which instruments they'd like to use. Um, so let me, I, I think I just wanted to reflect a bit on what can immediately be done. Uh, maybe I could request Rohan to quickly put up the slides, which I'll just go through just more, I think, Nishant on the question of the broader social protection architecture. Uh, Rohan, is it possible for you to put on the slides, please? So what I'm going to show you essentially is how does India's social protection system essentially compare, uh, not just in the context of the pandemic, but even broadly, when you compare it to other large federal uh, middle income and lower middle income countries. And I, I, I should say that I'm specifically looking at Brazil, China, Mexico, but also Indonesia and countries in, in East Asia. And, and, and two points I really want to highlight, which is important in fact, not just in the context of this pandemic, but moving forward, keeping in mind the labor force is going to go through tremendous churn. There is going to be future crises, not just because of the pandemic, but climate change, uh, a carbon neutral growth path. There are various uh, shocks that one can anticipate that are coming. So the social protection system really needs to perform in a consolidative way so that it picks up these dynamic changes in the local labor market. And I think keeping that in mind currently, what we don't have in India compared to these other countries, and I think Madhumita referred to it, uh, I actually think it's a very creative idea to have social registries, but the only ch challenge in India right now is we can't set them up prior to data privacy protocols being in place. So the personal data protection bill is in parliament, it is being debated. And in the meantime, in the absence of a clear consent and data privacy structure, because lots of data is going to move in the context of a social registry, uh, there are states that are in India, which have already started to learn from these examples and have used them uh, to scale up support. Uh, so you have, we're working, for example, with state governments such as Odisha, Kerala, who are in the middle of developing registries, Assam and Chhattisgarh as well. And these are platforms such that you can dynamically register people as opposed to expecting them to line up in long queues using technology tools and the local state. And this is a long path ahead, but we start to see that India is moving in that direction because still currently most of the programs have a very tight, small application cycle. And I, I won't belabor this point because I think it's been talked about. Um, the second issue I want to make is, other than the state disaster response funds, the other issue that we didn't really talk about is that there's more to social protection than just cash and in kind, right? And, and we see that in the context of the pandemic, as Amit showed us, in fact, shocks have been, even the salaried classes have faced significant shocks. Uh, and, and I'm sure even the data on indebtedness, it might be interesting to know what the current status is now you see that it's not just the chronically poor who need support ex post following destitution, but workers also be, need instruments. It could be social insurance fund, health insurance, life and accident insurance. And right now, if you compare India to other countries, the coverage of these social insurance programs remains woefully inadequate. The third quick point is why a lot of programs find it hard to dynamically register people at the local level um, is also because they're completely burdened in terms of bandwidth with the sheer size and volume of schemes that they are managing in India. So right now we have 390 direct benefit transfer schemes. None of these coordinate with each other. Uh, there are no harmonized methods of identifying beneficiaries. And yet the local state that's actually responsible for implementing a large chunk of these programs is essentially the same. If you look at other countries, you have much more consolidated streamline system so you would have 10 core national schemes and block grants going to state governments whereby state governments can decide much more locally tailored schemes and instruments and can update them uh, as need arises 
And the last point, I think on this, uh, which I will focus on is, I mentioned this earlier, we have the same sets of interventions across the board. And this is, I think, leading to the problem of the urban challenge that I think Shweta alluded to, which is that we have a rural Narega, a rural PM Kisan. We do not have the urban colliery, those programs. There's a new program for street vendors that's just been announced, but it's in extremely nascent stages. And India could consider learning from other countries to think about this X plus model where you have perhaps the PDS, Narega, and a large urban program with the fuel insurance schemes operating nationally and transferring the remaining budget to states to let them decide how best to use uh, these funds for their local population, so, which allows flexibility in the design as well as the delivery, which I think is absolutely key. The response has to be state-led. Um, finally, there is no accountability framework for social protection. Dumita was talking about accountability frameworks for local states uh, when it comes to districts or panchayats or, or urban municipal bodies. The challenge is, unlike other countries, there is no ministry of social protection. So these 390 schemes are scattered a vast set of agencies. And today, if we had to tackle any of the questions that Shweta put forward, be it a registry, be it the urban scale up, be it pushing up uh, a disaster responsive cash transfer in specific districts, who is the nodal body that is going to push that particular agenda forward, given that there are different roles that different agencies will need to play? And I know this is something that Dwara has been working on significantly as well. So it's absolutely critical to have some kind of coordination mechanism could be the NITIO, could even be under the 15 Finance Commission, there are proposals to create more consolidation. That would be very important. Um, let me just go to the next slide, and I'm not going to go through my third. Um, we essentially at the World Bank have uh, in partnership with CMIE over the past year, and this will continue, um, have a social protection module um, in, in their survey. And what I'm showing you right now is, I think it, 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 it again, given its robust representative, it just highlights, I think, the point that Shweta made, which is we see food reach people significantly more, largely because, as you see on the graph on the left, enrollment prior to the COVID lockdowns were just much higher for food programs, the PDS, particularly because states had also invested in scaling up access, and there was quasi-universal access with the NFSA. However, if you look at cash, what we find is coverage in urban areas is woefully inadequate again, simply because the schemes don't exist. There is no urban colliery yet of Anarega, and there are conversations, different states have set up an urban employment program to test it. Um, I think we'll start to see some of this being addressed, but again, it's early stages yet. And as a consequence on the right, you see when you look at all households who are accessing benefits as a share of the population, only about 27% of urban households have received cash, whereas their access to food is significantly higher. And making the point again that I made earlier, access to social insurance, retirement-based savings, or even small, small money co-contributory programs is extremely limited. And so I think for the longer term, any of these problems will not be solved without it being decentralized, recognizing the diversity and the heterogeneity across states, especially in their labor market and risk profiles. And with that, I feel what would be most critical is first thinking of mechanisms that help state governments scale up support using perhaps these state disaster response funds because they have the fiscal resources available in them. And secondly, of course, the nuts and bolts, which I think Madhumita did talk about significantly, perhaps using the PDS database as a first layer uh, might be an opportunity to think about scaling up cash. Um, and the third is to rebalance between the urban and the rural as we move forward. I'll stop there. If anyone is interested in further information, the paper will be up on the World Bank website soon. I'm happy to answer any questions. And over to you, Nishant. Yes, will we get a preview of the paper just because we attended this? It was my first question. Uh, OK, so I had a bunch of questions for you, actually. Um, Shana, because I think a lot of important points I think you had raised, and, and, and maybe we could move this into a general broader QA. So maybe I can go across all panelists and ask you guys about um, these things. Uh, set of questions I, I point out. So, firstly, I wanted to just flag that I think the whole idea of disaster response funds, not SDRF and NDRF not being used, I think is a very valid point. I'm very glad you brought that up. It's been a pet peeve of us to kind of just look at some of the ad hoc restrictions placed on these funds, not just for COVID, but even pre-COVID 
um, um, various disasters being tackled were not provided um, either funds or adequate funds by the central government and the state, state government not releasing funds. I, 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 maybe I am a little uh, uh, behind on my reading on this, but I remember there was a 10% cap on expenditure that can be funded through uh, SEO and um, um, but but some of that it does does kind of relate back to a point where maybe some of these excess funds can be used to design a new set of uh, social protection programs. And that's kind of my first question. You did mention things about expanding the PDS and and, and of delivery mechanism, um, and also we did, did touch upon uh, during Amit's presentation the idea of you know what do we do about employment, and I know he has a very interesting employment guarantee program that uh, he and the center to kind of thing. But what do you think is kind of the next step? So as you, one is maybe just a point on raising these funds, which you have pointed out, but where do we use that first? Um, is it through the PDS system as an institutional delivery mechanism because it seems to work and has existed for a long time now? Um, or, or, or is it that we just use its database and maybe think about rolling it out through banks and the financial system again, because there seems to be problems there. Thanks, Nishant. So quickly, in fact, the norms around the state disaster response funds have changed, which is precisely why now it's no longer the 10% cap. Uh, following the pandemic, in fact, I think in August or September, after the first wave, uh, they essentially allowed for a higher allocation. And in fact, in the 15 Finance Commission, this is very important because this is something I think a lot of people were pushing for to allow yes, states yes. more money, right? And you're, you were aware of this. Uh, what it does actually is in the formula for states receiving money, ecological risk, disaster risk now gets higher weighted. So earlier, if you remember, it was what we call an expenditure model. And this is very beautifully in detail laid out in the 15 Finance Commission report and the action taken report by the Ministry of Finance. Uh, what they used to do is you tell us what the expenditures are and then through that, you know, the typical certification business, you will get an amount. Now that's changed. It's, they've moved away. That's a key reform in the 15 Finance Commission, moving away from an expenditure model. What that does do is it allows states greater funds because they already had flexibility to use the SDRF following the pandemic because that 10% cap was removed. Now it's 40% actually that can be used for these kinds of activities. Um, and it gives them actually a larger share of the pie as well, which I think in the current circumstances with GST revenues and other issues around how much money the states have is very critical. I think quickly on your second point, I hesitate uh, to say this is the instrument. And I think you and I have talked about this before. I think, you know, economists will typically say, well, do the quasi UBI or only do the urban employment guarantee. My sense is, um, if you remember the debates around the do it, and I, I've read, I think, what Amit wrote about it as well on Ideas for India. I think there was a piece there also by Yamini Ayer, and she essentially pointed out, and I fully agree, that you need to give states flexibility in the way this, you know, which instrument, because I'll give you an example. We, in fact, just last week, Nishant, I, I think you, you know about this. We had a webinar with the Deputy, Honorable De Deputy Chief Minister of Delhi. Uh, I'd encourage those who are interested to just Google it. It's on the World Bank uh, Facebook page. Um, and we asked him, uh, what do you think about this urban employment guarantee idea? Because it's, it's, it's extremely important. Um, and I think it does also, the, the important part about it is also it helps build up the capacity of the urban local bodies to start to engage in these kinds of issues, as Manrega did do for the panchayats as well, which is very critical. Um, and he essentially said that, look, it really depends on what location you're in. He said that, you know, the employment guarantee program with the kinds of works and the, the public works or other kinds of, you know, tasks could work in, say, in Odisha or in a certain labor market context. But he said, perhaps in Delhi, we need to think about what kinds of jobs we put um, in the roster could be much more community service oriented, could be community infrastructure creation, right? It could. So I, I think instead of saying this should be the first place where states spend their money, I feel state governments need to, instead of having a one size fits all approach, let state governments decide. And you're already seeing Kerala, Maharashtra, they're all opting for very different mechanisms. Um, and that's also important in terms of setting the transfer value. Uh, because remember, a thousand rupees means something completely different. Um, between a Delhi and a Bihar, uh, or even a Delhi and a Bhuvaneshwar. And thinking about where the wage rates are, how will you index them? What is the design of works that are being offered to workers? And some states may just think this is 
too complex in terms of implementation and remember narega one of the challenges has been where states that take it seriously where it works well it works really well and then there are states who struggle to be and there's rationing of demand and there are all these kinds of issues given that let state governments take a call given that the state of disaster response funds allow you that flexibility um and i think we should be thinking about shifting the architecture of safety nets in india from large centrally sponsored schemes which are 390 in nature into more consolidated say 10 to 12 big schemes that operate across the country with significant benefit values and then send the rest to block grants through districts or to state governments i i feel this might be the architecture of the future if we are to deal with this constant flux and future crises and natural disasters are also going to increase in the country looking at the way data is what we're seeing i'll stop there over to you nishan yeah and, and we rank number 1 in the vulnerability to natural disasters index so it, it, it's, it's just no real discussion on that being excited okay so okay so we have about 10 minutes 11 minutes so i'm going to kind of marshal time a little bit um and really uh, really would follow some of the points that shana brought up which is just that i i felt there were two interesting things that i would like to pose to all uh, kind of uh, panelists as well and maybe amit i'll start with you is maybe a uh, what do you think about uh, you know how uh, states should be using additional funds that they may get either from the center or through their own coffers in kind of building more resilient uh, kind of social protection schemes so shana made the point that it shouldn't be one kind of one silver bullet maybe it's not something that you kind of launch nationally but you rather think about multiple options that state could states could have to kind of choose which way they want to go and uh, urban employment guarantee program could be one and uh, and there might be others so what is generally your take on that i, I know you guys have worked a lot on that and is is that something you would consider as a possibility yeah thanks nishant so very briefly um uh, you know i mean when we wrote that brief on urban employment guarantee of course none of this was there this was written well before the pandemic and we were in some ways you know so in the classic way appealing to the center because the center is the one with the money right and uh, i by no means think that that is that should be the state of affairs it's a it's a very diverse country and there's there's no way that really pretty much anything should be done in a centralized fashion uh, you know apart from very very key portfolio so i'm of that school of thought uh, i think decentralization in general works much better not uh, in every case and to every level that depends on what we're talking about obviously but for something like social protection it's it's very clear that it has to be a state led effort because states are simply at very different places not only in terms of the capacity of uh, urban local bodies or state governments to do something but also the structural transformation that is ongoing is very different in different states i mean some states are just structurally completely different from others uh, there are labor surplus states there are labor scarce states there are migrant sending states there are migrant receiving states Uh, and they can't be put in the same bucket when you think about these things so i'm all for more closely uh, you know thought through and localized policies on social protection uh, I, I, the only thing i will add here is you know uh, when we talk about employment guarantee versus other things for example um, you know there is the cash transfer pds sort of route which is essentially about widening the net right then there is a big bucket that we didn't really focus on today which is to do with giving social insurance to people who do not have fixed employer employee relationships uh and that's a huge thing with a lot of schemes and as usual a proliferation of schemes and so forth there i think we need to think closely and that applies to many states because even the structurally advanced states have a lot of informal workforces so uh how do you do that right and there i think the things like the mathari model which we talk about in this report and has been discussed widely in, in the maharashtra mathari workers model uh, is an interesting one because it's managed to do a tripartite contribution and division in an informal setting of casual wage workers uh, so we need to think through these welfare board mechanisms and how they work for these type of social protection which brings me to the last point that i will make which is the reason we harp a lot on things like public employment generation is because simply speaking the more you tighten the labor market the less work you have to do at the other end with regulations and so forth because you are improving the bargaining power of workers and conversely the more you leave labor market slack 
the more all the weight of the bargaining power is against you. Uh, and no amount of policing can compensate for the structurally weak position that workers are in. So that's where these employment programs are so vital because they are changing the negotiating power of workers and making it much, much easier to do other things, you know, uh, deliver social protection in other ways. Uh, so yeah. I'll stop. Yeah, that, I, that does, I, some of that actually kind of quite resonates well with, I think, what we've discussed also today, though, especially towards the end, uh, which is that maybe it is the case um, that some of these um, things have to be taught about at a state level, obviously, but then there's also these kind of problems that exist kind of across the country, especially, and and, and the one, one kind of big concern I would have, and maybe this is not for us to think about today and not discuss today, but generally go forward. Is that we also very, very, very similarly talk about the issues of migrants and would there, if there is a separate welfare program that exists for informal laborers in different ways in each state, and how do we think about the problems of resolving that problem for uh, for migrant communities across the country? So, I mean, if you are moving from one place to one place very commonly, then you would have to shift between welfare programs and welfare systems uh, quite quite almost readily. So all can be solved with a little bit more of design thinking and maybe something that we would love to discuss over time. Okay, so we have five minutes now. So I'm conscious about two things. I wanted to also get in um, one question from uh, uh, from uh, the audience. So um, uh, Priya Nanda from the Gates Foundation has asked a question. Should we think about long-term protection uh, to cushion against shocks, including medical shocks, given the high OOP expenses for healthcare and the ad hoc healthcare uh, seeking, um, and how should discussions of health insurance be brought into the question of the social protection approaches? So, I mean, I I I I'd, I'd love maybe uh, Amit to uh, take this one as well, or uh, but maybe I can give you just a kind of idea of how we're thinking about it, and then kind of resonates with what Amit said towards the end, which was just that we have to start thinking about social insurance programs. And social insurance doesn't necessarily need to be that way. There is a state-funded social, uh, state-funded health insurance, but just uh, public expenditure going towards building a more resilient health insurance um, kind of market, which we don't, which doesn't exist at all. So for example, one of my colleagues, uh, Hasna is working uh, with uh, as part of the Landsat Commission, which is trying to think about how can we get commercial insurance to work for, you know, low-income households, um, especially in health. And it, it just seems like an extremely complex problem, given that it's not just OOP and the fact of insurance itself, but it's all, it's about integrating healthcare systems and healthcare provision um, into a, uh, into an existing social protection uh, program. So I'm, I, it's a very, very relevant question. Um, and I do think it's, it's definitely part of our research thinking, which is it's not okay to just think about giving out us an insurance program, a social insurance program in the form of you know, cash transfers or whatever, uh, conditionally to you um, being part of some kind of income group that makes you vulnerable to health shock. But it's more large thinking about how do we then set up a commercial insurance market that works well for low income so I'm not citing this as an example to say it's positive. I know the, my, there are problems with microfinance, but then you see the ex existence of microfinance institutions uh, and the abundance of credit distribution, which is also leading to over indebtedness problems. But it, at least there is a market that exists to serve basic financial services products to, uh, to low income households. Can we create a similar market, vibrant private market with proper regulation um, for low income households? And, and, and I think there, that would be the, uh, that would provide ex like higher, higher levels of agreement. So I'm sorry for, for, for taking that question all for myself. Um, but okay, so let's maybe finish off um, this discussion. I know we're, we're kind of strapped for time. So I would kind of recommend everybody to kind of drop their questions on the chat box. Um, 
drop email, uh, you know, emails to any of the participants or the organizers who can connect us, take forward some of these discussions. But I do want to stop uh, and kind of uh, go back to both Shweta and Madhumita, maybe in that order, uh, to about what they think, especially about, uh, you know, about delivery channels for social insurance programs uh, and social protection programs. So, um, Shweta, you've worked a lot on assessing how these schemes have worked and how delivery in general uh, has been of welfare over the last year. Where would you think there is uh, scope for kind of, if you were to think about long term, where would you think uh, scope is? is it? Nishant, can I pass it to Madhumita first? I have a baby chit chatting in the background. Yeah, sure. So, Madhumita, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think where I would want to see delivery systems improve is, uh, as Shana was alluding to, programs rationalizing and as uh, uh, sort of uh, progressing towards a system that has a core set of social protection guarantees is the hope that the delivery systems would also then rationalize, right? Uh, because having so many programs is an enormous level of stress on frontline uh, capacity, right? If we have 300 plus programs, what it means is that for each of these programs, there is an administrative burden both on beneficiaries as well as frontline workers. Uh, who often have uh, less than zero incentive to be able to deliver on these programs. Uh, so hopefully as the number of programs rationalizes, other parts of the delivery system also rationalize. Uh, for example, it could be in the form of a common intake form across programs, which will uh, considerably reduce the burden on uh, beneficiaries, common verification protocols across uh, programs, um, in a sense, similar to what we've done with common uh, payment systems, right, which is the DBT architecture, which to an extent has uh, rationalized the uh, burden on the payment systems. Uh, so hopefully uh, these sort of improvements will improve the capacity to deliver social protection at the front line going forward. Yeah, oh, and, and, and I think that the important question there was also about kind of then how do we integrate maybe successful programs like PDS into the delivery of new world programs and kind of schemes. Um, yeah. I, think, I, mean, I think that is something that is alluded, which I think is a, is a good idea and something you should mm -hmm. consider is just maybe look at how um, some of the, uh, the tra cash transfers were made uh, for PDS beneficiaries uh, during the pandemic. Yeah. I thought that yeah. was quite successful. And I think also some uh, countries have used one of the core programs as the foundation for a social registry, right? You don't have to populate data from the scratch, but the list of uh, households in the PDS could be your foundational layer for building uh, a registry, uh, which a lot of countries have done. And I think in India with PDS, there's certainly the potential uh, to do that. Great. Okay. So um, just wanted to uh, bring it back to Shana. Maybe you could kind of uh, also respond to the question posed by uh, uh, Priya and also kind of give us your kind of concluding thought and then we could uh, finish up the session. Thanks, Nishant. Let me first start by saying it's very important for us to note that not only do we have a social protection architecture where we have 390 schemes, but 65% of beneficiaries actually only reside in five. So six, let me say that again, 65% of social protection beneficiaries in the country actually only belong to five, if you look at cash transfer schemes. And it begets the question, what about the remaining 300? And there's tremendous space there. Uh, even again, following the recommendations of the 15 Finance Commission, which says consolidate, rationalize, and exactly as Madhumita said, that would lead to consolidated delivery as well. I think on the question of insurance, I'm not going to go into the design of the product because our experiences actually have been that given the irregular nature of incomes uh, of workers, it's very difficult for the current products to actually suit uh, their specific needs, right? Um, and and I, I think given that what I'm really, I feel what's very important, and again, I'm not representing the views of the World Bank as an institution, although you will hear our country director mention this as well, but this is also a personal view as someone who's worked on this for 15 years. We have to have a body that monitors, coordinates, and holds accountable 
different line agencies to targets around coverage, targets around contributions, or else you will just have this complete proliferation of schemes, as Amit was referring to, even in the social insurance space right now, there are 27. Um, and that's not even counting the state schemes. And so I think what's absolutely critical if we are to monitor, target, and consolidate, so and have the right balance between social insurance as well as cash and kind, there needs to be a nodal accountability framework at the highest level with participation from states, which can chart out almost a five-year social protection plan for the country, starting from the current crisis and moving forward. I think it's the need of the hour. I'll stop there. Over to you, Nishant. I mean, again, a lot of a lot of these things. I think would, would be great to continue conversations on, and I and I know we will uh, as well. And I, I urge anybody in the audience also to just you know drop us a mail, discuss if any of these are close to home. I just wanted to kind of recap uh, what the session is about. I'm very sorry that we overran by about five minutes, and we might you know, overrun by about three or four more minutes. And I really apologize for that. Um, but I really enjoyed the session and I just wanted to kind of recap some key things that I thought were interesting, um, as well as, you know, other uh, members who have sent me some messages also have brought to my notice as things that, you know, um, have uh, kind of stuck with them during this time. So I, I, I think the stats um, on kind of income loss, on access to, um, on income loss especially, and access to kind of social welfare, are not something that would surprise us. Um, people who've studied this um, kind of over time, but what to me stood out was 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 what one of those things that both Shweta and Amit had pointed out, which is the unstable recovery of the employment and the labor market. And I think we will study this over a few more years. It's just the fact that the pandemic has shifted, has created a kind of very dynamic shift of the labor labor market structure completely. Why is this important? Because most of our social welfare programs are tied to employment as all of the panelists have allied to. And, and, and having to push them away from that formal setup, which albeit had its own problems, ESI and EPH and other kind of um, you know, con for contract enforceability when it comes to income, et cetera, still exists, minimum wage, et cetera. But the idea of at least you know, having stable uh, stable employment guarantees or providing some of le some level of social welfare, which is now disappeared for a large set of population, especially for women who have dropped out completely from the workforce and a lot from the formal workforce. Um, so this is something which I would think is a problem that we would need to tackle over the longer term to try and rebuild some sort of security functions uh, uh, for the labor market. Another very interesting thing that came out of the discussions was 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 then how do we deliver? So I think Madhuta raised the interesting questions around what cash transfer programs across different countries are doing and kind of positive results that they might be seeing. And and that's of that's that's that and that's something we might need to consider. Do we want to go um, cash transfer routes for the delivery of these benefits? Uh, maybe it works in some states, as she pointed out, in some of some of the literature also around DBT readiness across different states vary, and maybe in some states cash transfers might work really well, um, but there needs to be more options on the table, and which is why, you know, letting states decide whether they want to go to develop more social welfare programs in the form of you know, employment guarantees, or in the form of uh, cash transfers, in the form of expanding PDS, making it universal, et cetera, are all options that we should kind of consider and maybe lay down plans for that states could then pick and choose from based on their fiscal capacities. So I, I thought that was a very interesting point, um, both from Shayana and Madhulita um, had brought up. So uh, uh, something that we should kind of stick to in thinking about a little bit. The last, and I would stop with this, was this question on accountability. How do we keep these kind of, how do we keep the, how do we keep accountability when, the, when there is complete political incentive to introduce new schemes without consolidating old ones? So without getting into the political science problem of this, is there a more institutional design way of us dealing with these, with the problem? Is there, is there, a, is there maybe is there a role for a particular agency to play or maybe um, is there, the, the idea of consolidation brings together um, Kind of easier ways for us to track social welfare programs available to all cohorts of the population in different states. 
and this is kind of more of a governance problem and, and and i feel like it's this has been talked about for a long time but just no not, not really acted upon it really well and maybe maybe this is the time maybe this is the time with the introduction of so many new programs uh, whether all whether they be short term or or medium term in nature those uh, that are coming through um, it's something for us to really think about and kind of help design also so really urge everyone to put down your thoughts maybe share some ideas that really resonate with you and we would love i i, I and i'm sure i can speak for all the panelists that we we would love to engage uh, with anybody who has ideas on these uh, further and kind of work together on de- developing these problems uh, developing the solutions to these problems so i'm going to stop there i wanted to ask uh, rohan if i can close the ses- session Yes, thank you. Um, maybe I'll just uh, post a quick thank you slide. Uh, uh, just one little something. I uh, Shweta had to attend to her baby, so she's typed out her response on chat, which I've also shared with everybody uh, on the chat window. Uh, uh, we're already running a few few minutes over, but I'm still very very grateful to all of you who could make it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Yeah, uh, this was deeply insightful. I learned so much uh, today. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for that. Thank you for all of your time. Uh, and and as Nishant was saying, if you want to get in touch with any of the speakers, do write to us at hello at cornet dot in. We will put you in touch. Uh, more details about cornet on the cornet website and Twitter, and uh, also a whole bunch of stuff uh, happening in the first half tomorrow. uh some interesting follow ups uh, particularly uh dwara research talk to gramvani about uh social protection entitlements unpacking exclusion and sort of discussing some of their work around grievance redressal so that might be interesting uh id insight particularly speaking about uh, a project on take home rations that they did uh, also in in the morning and uh, also a really interesting dialogue led by ncaer on perceptions around vaccination uh, and and vaccine hesitancy and so on uh, two other really offbeat uh, showcases that we have tomorrow uh, at 11 uh, around misinformation and anxiety uh, from from this organization called good business lab and also from saha pedia on how uh, particularly the pandemic has affected the uh, budgetary allowances significantly within the arts and culture sector so there's there's a whole bunch of stuff tomorrow uh, please have a look out on 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 the cornet shed thanks again for all of your time um there are no plenaries tomorrow they've been moved to may uh, 7th uh, but all of the comms for that you'll find on the calendar already Uh, yeah thanks everyone uh, thanks again to jpal dwara and dalberg for co-anchoring this with us and for all the speakers who are still here with us so thanks to shansh sayana madhuita <laughs>